Rub up your engines! Well, you don't want to end up furious at the car, so today I'm going to tell you all about buying one of these Mitsubishi Lancer Evolutions. Now this one's an 03, first year they imported in the United States. It's set up so this little bitty 2 liter 4 cylinder engine could put out 271 horsepower. It's got a turbo and with the all wheel drive system, these aren't just front wheel drive, they're all wheel drive. There's the rear differential, you got the drive shafts going to the back wheels too. This one has a monster exhaust aftermarket system on it. These evolutions are loved by serious drivers, especially rally car drivers. Now, some people buy them mistakenly. So if you're one of those guys who wants to do burnouts all the time, you don't get one of these because they're all wheel drive. You can set them up to do burnouts, but you'll destroy the vehicle. Four wheel drive vehicles are not made for doing burnouts. It's mainly for two wheel vehicles. You could set them up that way if you wanted, but as the way they came, they're great fast rally cars. They're not something that you use to do burnouts with. Sure guys do, but they'll destroy the car, burn the clutch out in a very short period of time. They're not made for that, but they are fun to drive when they're running right. You can end up as the furious end of the Fast and Furious if you get one that's been modified incorrectly. So here's what you want to look out for. First, open the hood, look around, now look at this. This has got wires, loose wires all over the place. That's a bad sign because generally sloppy wiring means sloppy all around work and this particular one no longer stock it's been modified and that was a big mistake start it up and show you why it does start right up but right off the bat when you rub it up you can tell it's not right not only does it sound wrong it's missing some but it smells, and it smells of raw gasoline. Now being a professional mechanic, I got a fancy scan tool, and it shows me that it is running too rich. But even if you don't have a scan tool, one you gotta know is you can smell that raw gas, and check this out. When you stick your finger in, not only does it come out black, but it comes out black and wet. The black shows it's running super rich in the wet gasoline. This thing is actually pumping bits of raw gasoline out the exhaust. And strangely enough, when I hook up my scan tools to it, it has no trouble coats. That shows a number two problem with Mitsubishi's is they got pretty crappy software in them. If this was a Toyota running that bad, it'd be tripping codes up the wazoo. But alas, it's not tripping any codes, it just shows that it's running too rich. This is what I see all the time, why I advise people not to do it. This baby originally came with a turbocharger, it was designed that way. Now granted, it's like many Mitsubishi vehicles, somewhat cheaply made, because if you look and look and look, there are no boost gauges, so you have no idea how much boost this thing is giving out. And you might think, oh, just some stupid gauge, what does that mean? It means a lot in the turbocharged cars, because then you can see, is it boosting like it should, the right amount of pressure, is it not working at all? If you got a turbo on a car, you really need a boost gauge. This does not have one. It didn't come with one. And whoever added this ridiculous typhoon intake system. So when you do have problems, it's hellacious to figure out what's wrong with these things, especially when somebody put aftermarket parts on them. And after all, it is a Mitsubishi. I've been telling people for decades, Mitsubishis are basically throwaway cars. Back in the day, a lot of Plymouth Chryslers, they imported Mitsubishi, sold them under the Chrysler brand, and that's exactly what they were. Cheaply made throwaway vehicles. They could run okay for a while, but then when they broke, they cost too much money to fix and you'd throw them away. Now I do have to applaud the engineers that made this little 2 liter put out 271 horsepower, but at the same time, there's very little good analytics on a stock car to figure out what goes wrong with the one that came from the factory this way. And when you start adding aftermarket stuff like cold air intakes, all that stuff, that's not factory, it didn't come with any of that stuff on. It. It's all add-on things. You're going to make attempted repairs at least three times as complex to diagnose 
and repair. And in this case, the data that comes on my computer is totally absurd. And he fool can see it's running rich. You can smell it. You saw my black finger, raw fuel in the back. Part of my computer system, my scan tool, shows that the vehicle is running rich, which is quite obvious. But at the same time, the short term and long term fuel trim, how the computer tries to make it run neither lean or rich, but in the middle, both the long and the short term fuel is adding fuel. It thinks that the thing is running lean, so it's adding fuel. It's obviously adding too much fuel to get raw fuel coming out of the exhaust. Now I saw the same exact thing on one of these a few years ago. Had a similar aftermarket cold air intake, but the owner wasn't foolish. He had kept all the old parts. So what did Scotty do? He took off all this cold air intake garbage, put on the factory plastic air box with the factory airflow sensor, hooked it up the way it was supposed to be, and it ran like a clock. Now I've checked the cooling system with my block leak test. It showed the head wasn't cracked. A simple test is just to take it off like it is now and start the engine cold. And if you saw a bunch of air bubbles coming out, that's the head gasket being blown and throwing exhaust gas through. But as you saw, it was there. They'll always rumble up and down a little. There was no fumes coming out. I knew from my a block leak test that it didn't. If you're looking at one of these when it's cold, first thing, take it off started. You see fumes come out of it as soon as you started, run away, don't buy it. And if you want to go so far, you can easily take out the spark plugs and bring a compression gauge and do compression tests and see if all the compressions are within, say, 10, 15% of each other and they all have relatively high compression if you want to go that far. But when they run as poorly as this, <laughs> My advice again is hand the key back to the owner and don't buy it. You have no idea what has been done to the vehicle. Although you never know, you might get lucky like my customer did years ago. If it comes with all the original parts, the exhaust, the factory air box and sensor, and you get it for a cheap price, what the heck? It'd be worth a gamble to put the stock stuff back on because stock, this thing put out 271 horsepower. Plenty fast for a tiny little car like this. So now you know the truth about a Mitsubishi Lancer Evolution. They can be really fun little cars but they can be complete disaster areas if you buy the wrong one. And here's some bonus questions and answers. All right, here's some local news here in Nashville. BMW is shutting down their car subscription service. They tried it out in Nashville a couple years ago. And I'm assuming they're shutting it down because they weren't making much money at it. Not that many people were probably interested in it. BMW claims that, oh, they reached their target. But they don't tell anybody what the target is, typically, you know. BMW doesn't even want to give mechanics like me information on how to fix their cars. And they're not going to tell you, hey, they're shutting it down probably because it was a massive failure. Because, of course, it wasn't cheap. The cheapest one was $2,000 a month. And the higher tier one was $3,700 a month. If you want an M4, M5, or M6 convertible, then you paid all that extra money. I haven't met anybody here in Nashville that leased one like that for the subscription service, but other companies have shut theirs down, too. Mercedes-Benz pulled the plug on theirs, and they even cited mediocre fails. BMW's probably lying about it, but Mercedes at least was honest and said we had mediocre sales. Cadillac shut theirs down, but then they brought it back with a much more limited system. Now Hertz and Enterprise in some cities have subscription services because of course they're hurting like mad with this coronavirus. A large percentage of their profit was made from renting people cars at the airport. People aren't flying like they were so that's down so they're going to you know grasp at any straw. So they got cars that somebody will lease it off them whatever they can call it a subscription service whatever they want. They're in dire straits. They have to because they're not making a profit. And these are just in a pilot phase here with the rental car companies. Who knows what will come with that, but I don't see much of this. It's, it's a limited amount of people want to spend that kind of money. You don't want to buy it, lease it. The subscription services, they're kind of a halfway measure between leasing a car, owning a car, having a choice of different cars. It's just not panning out from either side. If the people don't want to pay that kind of money and the dealers end up getting back these cars that have been out for a short period of time, then they got to sell them or lease them to somebody else. They would much rather sell the car outright, but of course, since a lot of them have a hard time selling them out, right? Especially a company like BMW that has high prices. They're grasping at straws, and I guess they found out trying the subscription service out here in Nashville didn't pan out, so they're shutting it down the end of January. They're not going to take any more, they said. 
So if you never want to miss another one of my new car repair videos, remember to ring that bell.